Hi, everyone. My name is Michaela Ross. I am a fintech and technology and general reporter with Bloomberg VNA. And I am very happy to introduce our panel today. Um, we are going to be talking about, each of them comes from ex extremely interesting situations, um, watching the cashless economy advance in, in different areas. And what I mean by that on both the municipal level, country level, and even down to the transportation authority level. So let me introduce everyone. Sitting directly beside me is Life Trana. He is the Minister Counselor for Economic and Arctic Affairs at the Embassy of Norway. So he will be speaking a lot about how Norway is moving towards uh, cashless and how, what's driving that exactly, as well as some insight into the specific city of, of Oslo. Um, next to him, we have Pramad Saxena, who is the founder and chairman of Oxygen <coughs> Services, which is the first fintech company to offer digitized cash and distributed payments um, coming to us, uh, Indian-based. Uh, next, we have David, David Black Shackner. He is joining us from the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority. They are looking at how to do cashless payments on their vehicles and rolling out a system by 2020. And then last but not least, we have John Thompson. He is joining us, the Senior VP of the Center for Financial Services and Innovation, which focuses on serving the unbanked and underbanked populations, and is a Chicago-based. So let's get started. I would love to kind of dig in a little bit more to to get into the tangibleness of what all of you are seeing in your specific areas with the transition to cashless. So um, could you tell me a little bit about um, your perspective of, of the transition uh, and whatever area that you're working in and what was the motivating force behind it? What was the biggest benefit that was driving it? And if it's, if it's different even, what has been the biggest benefit as it's starting to roll out? Like, could you start for us? Uh, sure. Um... I think in Norway, what's been driving it uh, mainly has been a very aggressive push by the financial institutions to make people go go cashless. Uh, it's not that cash isn't read readily available. Uh, if you go into any grocery store and you know after you pay and get the cash back option, you can actually get the six hundred dollar equivalent cash back. So it's not like people can't get cash. But it's just you know people have gotten so used to not using cash that uh, that that. It's generally not used, so um, it's not just young people. I think 90% of people now use mobile online banking. Um, most millennials don't carry any cash at all. Um, they basically carry their credit card and their mobile phone, and that's it. Um, and they're so used to you know using apps and and, and their phones to pay that uh, I don't think <laughs> well some of them. Uh, yeah, don't deal with cash in their society, in their daily lives, and most you know most services are are digitalized, and you you pay either through an app or or with your credit card. So it's just it's been driven, as I said, mostly by the financial institutions who's tried to use this to cut costs, and and they have uh, the, actually the interest difference between uh, what you get for on a savings account and what you get uh, what you pay on a loan has actually been halved. By, by the financial institutions the last 20 years, and they've been able to do that by aggressively cutting branches and cutting costs. So, wow. so the benefits uh, first were, were being spurred for the private sector, but you're, they're seeing immediately benefits for a lot of consumers. You had mentioned in our comments uh, in our talk before that this is not a government-driven uh, mandated by any means. No, I think the government is desperately trying, I mean, I represent the government, but I think the government is desperately trying to catch up more than leading the charge here. But, uh, I mean, it's gotten to the point of, like, for it's going to be tax season and there's a lot of talk of tax reform. In Norway, 98% of tax things are done online. You don't see any paper whatsoever, and you, you basically, uh, you, you the, the form is pre-filled out with all your incomes and all everything from the banks and financial institutions. And unless you have some manual corrections or have some money stored away in the Cayman Islands or something, most people can do their taxes in five minutes with no paper. So it's getting better, but which does sound <laughs> um, coming from a very different perspective, though, on at least how the transition began. Pramod, could you tell us a little bit about? What has been happening in India and for, for those of us who have been uh, stuck here? Well, you know, uh, India is a completely different story. Um, we have uh, more than a billion people, 1.3 billion to be precise, and 94% uh, of all 
transactions in India are in cash, so it's a cash economy. But uh, over the last two years, uh, there has been an extraordinary push uh, by the government and the central bank uh, to both deregulate and open up uh, the environment for uh, private participation, for, um, for digitizing cash, and uh, to create a digital infrastructure uh, for uh, moving cash into digital formats. Uh, one of the uh, things that is, uh, that's very unique about India is uh, that has created uh, world's largest database, digital database of identity. It's called Aadhaar. And uh, today, almost 1.1 billion people have a digital ID, which is uh, biometrics, finger biometrics, and iris scan. And they've connected the digital ID uh, to the banking system uh, on a mobile platform, which allows people to transfer money or transact their bank account using their digital ID. So in other words, you can, you can open a bank account without uh, having any paperwork. You can hold money in your account without having a checkbook or, or even a card for that matter. You can use your uh, finger scanning uh, at, at, at any location where there can be a device that connects either it's a mobile-based device or, or a point of sales uh, that will allow you to transact your bank account. So this is something which is uh, changing and transforming uh, the way uh, digitization and access to banking uh, is taking place now uh, to the vast majority of Indian people who were uh, uh, up to about a year or two years back, they didn't even have bank accounts. So nearly 600 million new bank, account, bank accounts have been opened. And, and this transformation, uh, you know, in the form of a, uh, of a digital stat, as they call it, which is the banking switch that connects all the banks and creates a mobile platform, uh, you can create a virtual ID. Uh, a person doesn't have to disclose his bank account or his details or even his name and can transact uh, using a virtual ID to transfer money person to person or person to the bank account. So this is, this is something very extraordinary that I think hasn't happened anywhere. When you say that a person doesn't need to use their name or that person identifying information, is that to establish the bank account or is that just to make a transaction? Well, you know, to establish a bank account, you can simply do your uh, digital uh, ID scanning, you know, your, your finger scanning. And it's called EKYC. So you're done. You, you get a bank account. You can make, get money into that account, either somebody transferring it. For example, like government wants to transfer all of its subsidies and benefit payments, which amount to 60 to $70 billion every year, uh, into the accounts of people who didn't have bank accounts. Now, they need to transact this. And therefore, they have to have access uh, near where they are because banking penetration in India is very low. You know, uh, uh, in, in rural area in particular where nearly 700 million people live. So you can uh, use uh, uh, your ID to, uh, you know, finger scan without having to disclose your bank account or disclose any other information and, and draw money, deposit money, or transfer money, you know, from that account. Then the... Another stack which has been created is called UPI, Unified Payment Interface, where a bank customer can have on his mobile phone an app where he can create his virtual ID. It could be promote that something, you know, or, or I can use any other name. And if I want to transfer money to Michaela, so you can have your ID and I can just transfer it. And it happens on the same mobile platform. Would you like to try that out after the, the panel? Yeah. Okay. So it was very much, but the, uh, underlying it was very much a benefit for the government first and foremost. Is that correct? And, and what was the motive, What were some of the motivating forces that were pushing uh, that forward? I think it's not the benefit of the government. Yes, there is benefit to the government because the government wants to have more and more transactions coming into the banking system. That's the motivation for the government. They want to stop leakage from the subsidies and payments that they give to the people which are otherwise going through cash channels. So that's the benefit of the government for the people who were earlier not connected to the financial system, they can now do transactions. They can then access uh, value-added services like credit, lending, insurance, which otherwise are not uh, uh, reachable to them. You know? So there is benefit for the people. There is benefit for the government. And overall, the economy is going to see a huge transformation uh, with 600 million people coming into the financial mainstream, which otherwise they were not. Thank you so much. And moving to David, which is 
a, once again, a completely different landscape coming to us from Boston. Tell us what was the driving force to try to move towards, um, yeah, the situation that's going to move towards cashless vehicles within the uh, transit authority. So it's interesting. I mean, we are, if you have to think about what a transit agency is, a transit agency is essentially a very large uh, merchant with quite a lot of different assets. Um, with a public mission as well. And so when we think about uh, what we need to do, you know, like, like in DC, we've had a, a smart card system for a while, um, but we, we look at where our customers are and how our customers use our system. And you know, unlike other transactions where you could wait an hour or you know, that, that 15 seconds uh, where you are having your card authorized or otherwise paying, uh, when you're in the transit sphere, speed is really what matters more than anything else. And it's two different kinds of speed. It's the speed of the, uh, of the transaction that is you can't wait. You, can, you don't have that time to say, well, you know, I don't have any cash on me or I don't have this. We're going to have, um, you know, I'm going to go over to the corner store and then I'm going to come back. You'll have missed your bus. You'll have missed your vehicle. So we're, we're therefore not delivering services. The, the second piece is when you're making the actual transaction, um, and there have been studies that have shown this, if the transaction speed um, is, is greater than 500 milliseconds, is greater than half a second, it actually slows down the kind of service that we can deliver. And so you know, our decision is really about how do we ultimately deliver the product that we're supposed to deliver better, which is transportation for everybody. Okay, so it was, you were, the, there's two-sided benefit again, not only for the customers, um, but also for the transit authority. I know that in our talks before, you'd said that um, that would, gr instead of taking cash when you're on the actual vehicle, that greatly reduces transaction time and, yes. and improves service as well. Yep, absolutely, and there's, a, there's an infrastructure question there as well for us, because while we can remove cash from onboard vehicles, we, we have almost the exact opposite, where we have about 6% of our population is, is still using cash. Um, and so removing that is a, is a significant benefit, but we still have to support the population. Our, our mission is to make sure that everybody has access. And so um, we're sort of unique as a transit agency. If you think about the landscape of Boston um, and the Boston metro area, Boston is incredibly fractured in terms of its municipalities. We have I think we cover about 170 different municipalities um, within our service area. And so each one of those can't make a separate decision. But because of the speed and the benefits for us for service, we can internalize some of those externalities and put infrastructure on the street rather than on the vehicle so that people can essentially convert cash into our digital currency. Great. And John, can you add uh, to your perspective, from your perspective coming from? Sure. I, you know, I think as the other panelists, and you talked about there's some powerful forces that are drawing us um, this way, that are attracting us to sort of digitize payments, both uh, on the consumer side and the business side. Powerful forces um, at the merchant level to make things a little more efficient. Um, speed, cost, powerful things at the policy level from an inclusion perspective, the promise of additional financial inclusion and what may come from moving consumers into a system where we all can view and use data, including the consumer. Um, some powerful forces for the private sector as ways to acquire consumers, move those transactions into a system in which they can be monetized. So you've got people working, um, perhaps not together in a hand-holding way, but certainly you know, in pursuit of some, um, some uh, goals from their own perspective. Um, you know, from a consumer standpoint, I think there's some really interesting promise to the extent that, that um, providers have access to information about the day-to-day -day behaviors of consumers. How do we help people spend better, save better, borrow better, plan better? And a lot of the, the oxygen for that is data. And when that's occurring and off the rails, it's difficult to get at for everybody involved. So uh, fundamentally, the way that you're coming to this issue is when you look at the benefits of it, um, and we're going to talk about the challenges in just a second. Um, but this is an opportunity, you see this is an opportunity for, once again, serving uh, communities that may be unbanked or underbanked, um, to get that data, not just maybe to facilitate more transactions for them, but to also potentially offer new services. I think that's a fair way to say it. The, um, you know, as a nonprofit organization focused on consumer financial health, what we're, you know, interested in is sort of the progress and success and outcomes, not just of un- and underbanked consumers, but more broadly. Um, 
there's real promise as we think about the benefits of digital tools, again, for spending, saving, borrowing, and planning, if we have access to that kind of transaction level data. We, as an industry, as a sector, there's some real promise there for being able to assemble that back, provide it to um, consumers in a way that's helpful that they can act against. Great. Well, all right. Now let's dig into the challenges here. <laughs> um, in our discussion before, we kind of covered a gam gamut. So I welcome uh, different ideas from each of you. But uh, logistically, there are obstacles, uh, cybersecurity-wise. Uh, we talked about obstacles. Privacy, um, even if it's not access and privacy, seem to be four of the top um, challenges. So, uh, Life, could you start us off again? And kind of where are you seeing? I know that we discussed the... Um, the cybersecurity issue especially, uh, and and the functioning of the system. Um, if the digital payment system goes out, that can really you know, freeze commerce. So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, where you see the challenge and how you've been, uh, Norway's been dealing with it. Well, um, if you have a system where people don't carry anything but their phone and their credit card around, if either the uh, phone stop working and or the banking system or, or the interbanking system that basically uh, would approve a transaction stops working while you're, you have a hard time doing anything, basically. So um, I, the, what the government is doing to, to, to try to prevent that is, is uh, along with uh, the, the major companies investing pretty heavily and the companies have as well in, in, in um, getting, you know, th that you have several mobile systems, for example, up and running. So if one, one big company goes down, the other companies have to, you know, provide service to, to their customers. And, and the, there are at least three or four major companies with, a, with good coverage throughout the country. So, uh, and cybersecurity, that's an on ongoing issue, where, but it's, um, you know, being a much smaller country. We're a country of 5.2 million, not a country of some billion. And, and there's uh, pretty close cooperation between the major financial institutions and the government on cybersecurity, trying to identify threats and, uh, and ensuring that uh, you know, disruptions don't happen. I mean, there are th literally thousands and thousands of attacks every day, but we haven't, we've had issues with the mobile system a couple of times, but not, not a problem with the bank banking system this far, knock on wood. I was going to say, it seems like a lot of those attacks would be targeted at the private sector. Um, yeah. Since, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and versus the, the government sector. Ramon? Yeah, well, you know, like I said, uh, uh, you use your uh, digital ID, you, de you disclose nothing. And it's a very secure um, uh, system. Of course, the database, the digital database, which is maintained by the government is, is the key. and. Uh, I think uh, uh, they are uh, uh, they're constantly working on making sure that that database is not compromised, right? Um, there are privacy issues. I think uh, there are challenges which are, which are being addressed. But uh, the important thing is that in, in this whole India stack thing, UPI and digital, uh, you, do, you reveal nothing. You don't write your account number. You don't give your password. There is nothing. So at, at one level, it's a, it's a very secure uh, arrangement, so long as the digital database itself is, is, is secure. OK, so yeah, that becomes much more the responsibility of the federal, on the federal level to make sure that that is protected. That sounds like a huge challenge. Do you, you know, come, as a private business owner, do you, how do you mitigate that risk? Because that's something that's out of your hands. Well, you know, uh, f first of all, we haven't been in, in digital transactions using biometric, uh, we haven't seen risk frauds at the, at the customer level for sure. Um, there has been some uh, misuse of, uh, of, of the digital data uh, by some of the operators, perhaps unknowingly, and uh, this is being fixed. So they are bringing in um, um, uh, transparency, they are bringing in more regulation around how this data is to be used, and I think it's a process, but there hasn't been a very serious challenge yet uh, seen in, in, in this environment. It's not that there isn't going to be one. Uh, so this is clearly a top of the mind issue for all, all businesses and also for the government and the regulator. Okay, great. David? So it's interesting for us. We get the benefits from moving over towards 100%, from moving really towards people not being able to use cash on board vehicles which means that our challenge is a lot um, going forward about 
consumer acceptance and about um, reaching that last portion of the population, uh, which means that it's not, it's not the, probably everybody in this room that becomes the issue. It, it's the issue of people who are older, uh, people who are not necessarily in the, uh, the typical economy and are outside of that, and, and how we reach them and get them uh, towards that acceptance. And, and a lot of that is ultimately, I think, addressed by infrastructure issues about making sure that it is ubiquitous, that the change doesn't feel like something that is huge, but it feels like something where I used to pay on board a vehicle, now I can pay right next to the vehicle before I get on board. Um, similarly, one of the issues is in terms of even people who are in the, in, you know, in, in the banked economy uh, has to do with privacy. Um, mo your mobility data is, is about the most important data that, that you can think about you. It indicates where you live, where you go to work, it indicates your entire travel pattern. Um, and if that's connected to your actual identity, then uh, there can be significant difficulties, whether you know on the government side or um, you know going through any sort of uh, God forbid any sort of issue, um, you know where where you're hacked into that. And so you know one of the things that we've been very clear in terms of pushing the industry on is making sure that it's not just the financial data itself that's protected, but that there isn't a line where the financial data and the mobility data can be connected, so that it's something that can't possibly be abused. Um, it's, it's not something where we have to re, uh, rely on sort of the, those human roles to keep that from happening. It's something where it's actually built into the technology. Okay, so that transportation data would be siloed, basically. Completely separated. and totally. Connection is not able to be made except by the customer themselves. That is that they own that connection. Okay, great. John? I'm actually going to ask you, you a question. Yeah. So if I, if I heard it right, you're down to about 6%. Yep. Do you have to get to zero before you get the benefit? Because it, is it one, two percent that sort of where you have a critical mass and it all falls over? Or does it have to be zero? You, you get more and more benefit from, from getting lower, but, but ultimately, and, and this goes into the sort of details of how transportation systems are run. Oh, I, but, tell me. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but it, it's, so re, reliability is dependent upon the same thing happening again and again and again. The reason that buses, for example, come together isn't because um, everybody isn't, isn't necessarily just because of traffic or because of poorly run transit agencies. It's because if somebody pays with cash and it takes a minute there, then the bus behind it is a little bit closer and then they, they come together and they come together. So even when you get down to 1%, you can really, le you, you, you will not get 98% of the benefits. You'll get 30% of the benefits. Got it. Uh, you know, I think, I mean, yours, Michaela, was a, was a security question, um, and I think in some ways it leads into um, a couple of other uh, maybe risks or challenges associated as we look at this issue from a consumer perspective. Um, you know, certainly there's still a, uh, you know, a modest but important sector of uh, U.S. consumers that are operating outside uh, mainstream banking systems, 8 to 10 percent, depending on how you want to measure it, slightly lower if you throw in prepaid cards and other kinds of things like that, depending on the payment instrument that we're using. Um, but underneath those payment interests, this identity issue that you've solved, um, I think is still a really challenging one um, in this country. If you're in the system and you're recognizable, things generally work pretty well. But if you fail one of those systems, increasingly the process to establish uh, positively your identity to engage in such a transaction is a really complicated one. It's a really risky one for the institutions involved, um, which, you know, at a certain level, the consumer's um, navigation of, uh, of that transaction successfully becomes, in many ways, subordinate to the institution's protection of their risk in that transaction. Absolutely. So. Now, I have a follow-up question for you, John, but we had our clock stop for a couple minutes, so I just want to make sure, as much as I'm enjoying this conversation, I want to make sure that we're respecting the time. So about how much time do we have at this point? Is that correct? Yeah. All right, guys. <laughs> um, all right. So, John, but when you're talking about getting people onto the banking system mm -hmm. um, could you, and promote, that kind of seems like where this digital identity has been established. Um, is that, let's, let's transition into to the policy talk, we are in DC now. Mm -hmm. um, so when you talk about making this accessible to everyone in a community or, or within a city state, within a, a country, how are we gonna get those digital identities established? 
it's interesting. I'd love to hear. If it's not, two, I'd love to. I'd love government. to hear the two on the end, sort of talk about how to, how it happened in theirs. Um, you know, look, we've made incredible progress at bringing consumers into um, both the payments and the financial system over the last 15, 20 years. We're still chipping away at that. All providers are. There's a solid business case um, for that. Um, as we in our organization assess the market opportunity. We're talking about $140 billion of fees and interest paid by consumers who are, in our definition, underserved or operating outside. There's market opportunity there significantly. Um, uh, and it's both being attacked by people who are trying to account for um, or create account level or transaction level relationships, but in some ways, you know, what, what David and organizations like his or startups that are attacking this model are doing where we're saying, let me solve a problem for the consumer, let me help them ride transit. And now I've created effectively a financial relationship that ultimately now is digital. Um, there's, I think, some really interesting possibilities where in, you know, either startups or incumbents are addressing a need for the consumer not directly tied to payments, but it gives us a digital relationship that could lead to payments. Okay. On the opposite end, though, as well, when we're talking about privacy issues, Pramod, you said that there's also been concern with higher income individuals and all of their transactions being tracked. How is that being addressed? Well, I think uh, there isn't uh, really tracking of these transactions. Uh, uh, they, the benefit at uh, the lower end, in fact, is much more pronounced where the transactions history and the and the transaction tracking can allow people to get more benefits you know um, and, and and it's just the beginning uh, we see a huge transformation uh, and uh, there is uh, a great deal of enthusiasm as well there are um, concerns and there is skepticism around how successful this is going to be but so far uh, the indications are that uh, people are less concerned about uh, tracking of their uh, transactions. Uh, they're more on what benefits they can, they can get out of it. And I think uh, that's what ultimately matters, you know. Okay. So, yeah. So on the ground right now, how easy is it to do a cash payment? Well, you know, cash payments are still, there is a lot of cash uh, moving. Um, uh, uh, you know, when India took a step of demonetization of currency, which was perhaps for the largest ever in the world, and it kind of created an upheaval. But uh, the whole process um, uh, happened, I would say, pretty smoothly, you know, to credit to the government, and they steadfastly stuck to it. Uh, and that time, the government itself took a proactive role uh, to create education for, for masses, uh, for why digital transactions are important, and, you know, how they would like to curb uh, cash uh, to, to plug corruption on one end and, and also to sort of uh, progress, uh, progress the, you know, the financial services in the rural areas. So I think uh, there, is, uh, there is a good intent in the message to the public. Uh, there, are, uh, there are concerns always with any such, such thing that's done. But uh, uh, overall, uh, we, we see that the long-term benefit will far outweigh uh, the, the disruptions that may have been caused in the short term and the concerns that are there which will be progressively addressed. Uh, never before one has seen in India at least a government so committed uh, to driving uh, a policy of, of a nature which has implication on, on the entire population. And uh, they've, they've just not been proactive, very progressive, and opening it up very fast. I mean, for example, the, the, the national switch access has been opened up to all private entities, including, you know, Google has just launched a mobile wallet on, on uh, NPCI's platform. Um, there, is, uh, there is talk of uh, WhatsApp doing it. There are several Indian players doing it. So I think the whole process of digital transformation is getting democratized in India in a very big way, something that has not been seen anywhere in the world, I can say. And I may also say that this, I think, is uh, perhaps the first innovation, which is homegrown Indian innovation. It's not a cut and paste model from the West not even a Chinese model. And I think this model of India stack with digital uh, and mobile connectivity and bank accounts and, and you know, uh, is, is, is something which is a, a model that should be copied anywhere else in the world. So okay, that's in innovation. That's a great transition then. Okay, so yeah. if, if this model can be copied and pasted, um, let's say to the US, I would love to hear your perspective on some of the policies to, to help promote some of the benefits that we talked about while avoiding some of the challenges that we've discussed, 
um, cybersecurity, privacy, accessibility, logistics, um, w if you were to move this model to, to other countries? Well, you know, countries, you see, India is a very complex country, and I think there are many other countries which will find use for, for this model. Very distributed environment, uh, you know, accessibility to banking system, not easy. Um, you know, you can distribute uh, banking, for example, the, uh, uh, the point of sales uh, uh, device that, uh, that we use, which allows all kinds of payments and banking access at a single point as a low-cost, technology-driven uh, access can be used anywhere. For a couple of hundred dollars, you can provide access to banking uh, in the remote areas. You can provide access to all payments. Government is, you know, bringing in all the billers on the same platform where the banks are. So, you know, the entire ecosystem of banking, of payments, end-to-end, uh, -end, uh, is going to be accessible at a point, and I see no reason why it can't be replicated anywhere else, even in, even in the United States. I mean, you still have 40%, 50% payments in cash, and, and there is accessibility issue here as well in, in the remote areas. So, so the model, I think, would work anywhere. It's just, and it will be perhaps easier in, in U.S. because you have a digital ID of some sort already. It needs to be uh, linked to your, um, uh, you know, um, uh, iris or, or, or finger scan or whatever. Uh, it's, it's not no longer uh, only a number, but it's, it's a person present, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, authentication, uh, which does away with the need for any kind of paper or card or even a mobile phone to be carried for, for doing a transaction. Okay, thank you. Like, could you add to this? What are some of the, from what your perspective, what you've learned, policies that could be put in place to help ease the transition to a cashless uh, area or society? I, I, I think, again, um, our, our country is sort of uh, very much uh, a society with, with a great deal of trust. So, uh, one of the issues that was mentioned here, like corruption, you don't trust your financial institutions or your financial data, that, that hasn't been much of a problem. So. Um, we, we do then have, like here in the States, we do have one ID number per person. So you're sort of uniquely identified by one number, uh, which then again opens up some security issues. I don't think we've ever gotten into the th thought of doing biometrics, which, which obviously would be the next step. Um, and and in again, Norway. in Norway, and again, um, <clears throat> Just a, thought, uh, a story of how, how sort of you get people into the banking system. <clears throat> in, in Norway, this was done um, 40, 50 years ago when, <clears throat> sorry, the tr uh, actually, uh, as part of the, the big labor contracts, we have s m centralized contracts. The banks basically promised the wage earners that if you do away with your, with your basically cash pay, people used to you know, come home with their salaries in, in cash, if you do away with this, we promise we will never charge you for withdrawing your cash. And that was held. So, so that was a deal the bank said, would, if you do away with your cash, if you promise to you know, let the employers pay your cash into the banking system, we will not charge you to, t to get your cash out of the system again. So sort of again, and I think this is hard to replicate in such a you know, a great and diverse society such, such as India and, and the United States. But, but trust, that sort of worked and it, it got everyone into the banking system. Then the banks, again, as I said, aggressively pushed people to, to do digitalized and allowed you to still use the old models, but basically it became more and more and more costly to do either cash transactions or pay. I haven't seen a check in Norway in 40 years. When I came here in 2000 and, 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 and people were still using checks, I thought it was a joke, and even more so <laughs> coming back here when, you know, for school things, you, you have to write a check for your kids' school supplies or whatever. It's like... My landlord does not think it's a joke. Yeah, I know, <laughs> but, but, um, but again, it's sort of been pushed by, by a pretty aggressively priced differential, uh, differential between the digital services and the, you know, normal cash or paper-based services and then you know people have switched um, even you know not the whole older population but but I mean you have you know uh, like in retirement communities people are given each other digital courses so that you know yeah I, I guess you could see the same down in the villages in Florida people helping you know one some seniors helping other seniors but but uh, 
again, you know, making it accessible and, and have the pricing differential being enough, then at least 99%, and I agree with you, a lot of the benefits don't occur until you get to 100, and we haven't got to 100 yet, like in transit, but, uh, but we're aggressively moving there. Okay, that is interesting. Yeah, if there be any policies in place to, to try to move that towards the 100% mark, um, if you're gonna get those benefits on the government level, or on a banking level, are you saying? Yeah, and, and just like the government, the government is now requiring everyone to have a digital mailbox, and they're basically telling you when you get mail from the government, you will, if for the next three years, you'll get it both digitally and in paper, but in three years' time, we're not, not gonna send you anything in mail anymore. Everything is gonna be digitalized. Okay. Has there been any educational efforts by the government to try to help, for example, older citizens or uh, understand how to access their, uh, their online accounts? There has, um, there has, but, but again, as I said, 90% of the population already use mobile banking, so sort of it's the, 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 the remaining population that you would need to educate to do digital solutions are, have gotten rather small because, you know, most people, you know, even my age, I'm in my upper 40s, have, have done this, and I have one of my interns here, and he probably, you know, to him, this is not even an issue. So, okay. and you know, you were talking about apps. We have now very popular apps that, you know, if you go out on the town with three friends, they don't, you know, they, 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 couple of clicks on their phones and they've transferred, well, I owe you $15 for that drink and I owe you $20 for that meal and, you know, no cash anywhere. Frictionless, absolutely. David, tell us a little bit more about policies in place uh, in the Massachusetts Bay Area yeah. uh, that helps to promote the transition and then securing people's uh, identities and challenges. There. Yeah, I, you know, this is something that, that we're just beginning to face now as we go towards the rollout, but, you know, it, it, it strikes me as the, the education piece is really the thing that we are going to focus on more than anything else um, because of that portion of the population, you know, in the same way that uh, you know, we, we all can be cashless right now in this room, but there's a portion of the population that either can't or won't for various other reasons. And so that education and persuasion as well, right? Because it isn't just about here are the benefits, lay them out. It's not like the benefits haven't been laid out thus far. It is, it's really a, a campaign of persuasion. Here's why the benefits accum, you know, accrue to you, and, and here's what you get from it. Um, and I think that that's, that's a lot of the, the policies that we need to put in place, in addition to all of the, the, the infrastructure and the physical pieces uh, that, that lay behind that. Okay, and you did say that you, um, the, the Transportation Authority is developing this because you have yeah. the resources to do it, the, the drive, the motivation, um, because the benefits are so clear but then this can be used in other portions of the municipal government. Yeah, absolutely, and you know, the, the thing that's really important to us, so the, the driving factor for, for why we do something like this is to get the benefits that uh, accrue to us right now, but it, it's definitely on our mind that going towards a digital currency for this population sets us up for the future, and, and we think about it as a transportation future. You can go beyond that to the city. Um, for example, you know, the Boston is at the center of what we do and, and we've had lots of interesting conversations with Boston already about how you use this and how you use a single currency to uh, deliver social services and to then use that digital currency to also integrate with transportation. Uh, but one of the things that we think about is, um, so I think about, I, you know, took a, I took a, a VIA over here. Um, and if you're not on a digital currency, you don't have access to that right now. Um, and so, you know, one of the questions for public agencies over the course of the next 10 to 15 to 20 years is how do we continue to fulfill our mission to be able to provide that access that makes cities like DC and cities like Boston go for 100% of the population when we've got these disruptive technologies that are out there, whether they are, you know, uh, ride hailing and ride sharing or whether they are you know, the autonomous vehicles that are coming down the road. What's the role for an agency in making sure? And we think that, that exactly going towards payment is what allows us to continue to have a say um, and continue to ensure that we're providing that access to everybody. 
Thank you, absolutely. So I would like to open up the floor to questions. Uh, we do have a couple microphones. Um, questions for our panelists? Yes, right up here in the front. Hi, um, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Isabel Hoagland. I'm with Inside US Trade. And just in terms of policies that um, you're mentioning, uh, is there anything in trade policy in particular that impacts e-payment capabilities, um, particularly in financial services chapters of free trade agreements or potential um, currency provisions that are being discussed? That's a great question. <laughs> slightly outside of, of um, my specialty area. But, and you know, I think, you know, when we as a nonprofit organization are looking at it more at a um, consumer level, um, but I think perhaps some of the questions and hopes that we have from a policy standpoint might apply to what you're, what you're talking about. You know, so much of the sort of consumer facing um, regulatory policy is around fixing things that went wrong um, in the past or setting up guardrails around um, protection from evil. And I think if we want to embrace this kind of change, we're going to need regulatory leadership that starts to say, how do we want it to be? Not how do we not want it to be or how do we not repeat what happened in the past? And I think um, you know, what we are seeing emerge in Promote's business and his country and in others here um, is a, you know, is a vision of a payment system that we can't quite conceive yet. And we've got to get our policymakers thinking about what that will look like. Some principles-based regulation to enable that kind of change as opposed to rules-based regulation that sort of codifies some hopefully better version of the past. Um, so you know, I think that's something that uh, would apply pretty strongly to the question you're asking. Any other comments on trade? Yes. Just um, I think in order to, uh, I, I, I used to do trade in my, one of my previous incarnations and, uh, and um, for financial services I, I think uh, the, you, you need openness but you need common rules so you, you, jo you don't just need a, in a trade agreement per se but I think the sort of common rules in the, in the Basel system for example on banking uh, those are equally or probably more important to, to consumer protection, to having sort of a level playing field between financials and institutions than what you would put in, a, in the trade chapter of, of, a, of a trade deal. And I think for, for smaller countries such as ourselves, we, we fo I mean, we're part of the EU common market and we would follow the same uh, rules as the EU. It would be impossible for, I think, a smaller country to try to sort of go it alone on financial regulations. It just wouldn't make any sense whatsoever. I've worked uh, with foreign affairs before your work with the embassy and working on WTO matters. Yeah. Right. Great. Ramon, you should be thinking Well, you know, uh, in India, uh, the, uh, the policy level changes and the regulation has been continuously being upgraded because what, what happened is completely new and learning uh, every time. In fact, for, uh, when the mobile wallets were launched, for example, about six years back, we have had three revisions of uh, policy uh, from the central bank and the government has been implementing new and new regulations around it to making sure that they remain up to date and, and they're, they're looking at uh, regulating this market uh, very, very carefully at the same time not allowing um, uh, the tight regulation that uh, are applied to the banks to kind of uh, stifle the growth of this, uh, this sector, which, which is where innovation and agility and to, to be able to do things creatively um, uh, is the objective. So um, you see, we are, we are, we are seeing this, uh, uh, there's a great tolerance, I would say, uh, from the government, but they want transparency. They want um, very clear, um, uh, you know, compliance, um, uh, particularly anti-money laundering and, 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 and some of those uh, issues. So there are checks and balances. And, uh, uh, you know, the, like I said, it's an evolving, it's an evolving environment and a very promising one. So uh, it, it's, it's playing uh, the policy and regulations playing a, a supportive role, actually. Great. Do we have other questions coming from the audience? Yes, at this table. 
Uh, hi, my name is Andrea from Dahlberg. Um, and my question is around um, the business models that incentivize consumers um, to take on digital uh, electronic payments. Um, and, and I'm struck by the example from, from Norway because there's a lot of cost involved in digitizing payments and that somewhere in the business model, somebody's absorbing those costs. Um, but the Norway example is fascinating because I, I assume it's banks that agreed to take on the cost of some of that digitization in order to incentivize, uh, to offer to consumers that they don't have any costs associated with, with extracting their cash. Um, but if I think about like a transit example here in DC, I pay $2 for every one of those Metro cards that I take and, and then lose and have to buy again. Um, and then presumably the Metro system is absorbing the cost of that payment, the, the use of my credit card to buy the, the card. Um, and so the question is around that, that last 6%. Um, what are some of the models where um, there are positive incentives being offered to consumers, um, especially those last consumers, to, to, to agree to use that electronic payment? I, I can just start. Uh, just as a transit example, if you would go on a subway in, in, in Oslo or a bus similar to what you would do in Boston, uh, you would pay anywhere between. It's actually they, they charge you a set amount extra if you if you pay by cash. So it's a pretty again. It's everywhere from 20 to 40 percent extra on the ticket if you if you choose to pay by cash instead of paying by you know by an app which most people now use or. or or then buy your ticket at, at, a, at a booth beforehand. Um, and, and same as I said with banks, I mean, you, you pay for the services and uh, the banks have, have gained, I mean, we've cut the number of bank branches by more than half the last 20 years. So we have less than half of bank, the bank branches in, in Norway per capita than, than they do here. And 90% of the bank branches would, would not have cash. It would only be advising and, and loan and stuff like that. So they've gained a lot of savings by, by sort of aggressively putting, pushing their customers to, to, to use online banking and, and not show up at a, at a local branch. It's interesting because we've had that same set of incentives in place for quite some time and as I think there are here as well that if you pay with cash it's, you know, it's a premium of somewhere between 30 and 50 percent versus, versus not paying with cash and still there are people who, who persist. Um, and so I think the question is, is a little bit less about the, or the answer is a little bit less about providing a carrot, um, because it's really that the benefits accrue to us. Um, you know, that's sort of the unique thing within a very large agency perspective, which is that we have both a social mission as well as having, you know, an internal drive to, to cut our costs. And because this can either cut our costs or improve our service, it, we get so much benefit from it that it is worthwhile to uh, not just use a carrot, but also to otherwise um, remove cash payments from onboard vehicles in order to, to sort of have that, that cutoff point. Um, you know, at a certain point, getting down to that last 2%, you can't go house to house and, and ask people to do it. You, you have to make that ultimate policy decision, which says we are willing to make this leap because the benefits come to us. Uh, in such a large degree. I think we have time for one more question, sir. Oh, there we go. So I'm uh, Bill Cunningham from Creative Investment Research. I want to push out a little further, find out where you are on uh, using some of the new financial technologies, uh, blockchain, uh, Ethereum, uh, from the standpoint, specifically from the uh, transit perspective of uh, perfect price discrimination. So you could imagine an Ethereum-based fare uh, that uh, adjusts based on where I'm getting on the bus, where I'm getting off, also adjusts based on my income, and automatically brings all relevant discounts to bear <laughs> on, well, it's coming, it's coming, uh, you know. Uh, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, whatever. Uh, this is pretty much how things are gonna be. So I'm just curious as to, if you guys have looked at that stuff. I, I think there's a lot of interesting um, possibilities that come out of that, and obviously a lot of challenges that come, come from that as well. You know, one of the things that we have to think about when we talk about what is ultimately a question of fares and how much our, uh, you know, how much our, our riders pay is that we are um, quite heavily regulated 
by the Federal Transit Administration in terms of what we can and can't do. And I think that that's an important constraint that's put upon us in terms of ensuring that that sort of discrimination, price discrimination, can't negatively affect our customers as well. It's really interested in your perspective on that. Well, it, 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 uh, the emergence of these technologies have, uh, perhaps at this point, sort of equal opportunity for nefarious use as positive use. You know, um, it gets at some of the policy questions that I raised before. How do we envision the future and set um, something around that as opposed to just look the past for consumer protection? This is a real dilemma. Um, I think you know, you've got a municipal infrastructure to use. Um, where I live in Kansas, you go 50 miles west or 50 miles east, there's an entirely different kind of infrastructure, both at a government level, at a merchant level, at a consumer level, you have all kinds of different issues. Um, it's going to require some real creativity and attention. All right. Thank you all so much. We're going to wrap up the session and move to our next one. Thank you for joining us.